John and Judy Young lost their son Jeffrey in the suicide bombing of the Marine Barracks on October 23, 1983 in Beirut, Lebanon. Over 200 other military personnel lost their lives that day. In this Armed Forces Heritage Museum documentary, Judy Young talks about the tragedy of losing their son, of becoming a Gold Star Mother, and of her efforts to place a Gold Star Mother's family monument in Arlington National Cemetery. Hi everyone, my name is John Runyon, a former United States Congressman for the 3rd Congressional District of New Jersey. And I'm here to introduce to you a documentary about Judy Young and the Gold Star Mother's Monument. If you ever have the opportunity to meet Judy, and you will throughout this documentary learn who she is, she's a very special person and a very passionate person. So it's an honor for me to introduce to you to Judy Young through this documentary of her journey. Uh, today is uh, the 1st of February, 2016, and we have the opportunity to interview Judith Young, past president of the Gold Star Mothers. Judith, who are the Gold Star Mothers? Well, the Gold Star Mothers term began in uh, World War I because of the service flags that were hanging in the windows. The blue star would mean that someone was in the service, and when someone died, they put a gold star over top of it. So they began calling them Gold Star Mothers. Tell us about your son and, and uh, uh, what happened. When Jeffrey was little, he always wanted to be a soldier. He was a gymnast. He, he used to ride a unicycle. I mean, he was um, wiry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Daredevil. He climbed up on the top of uh, one of the water towers. He was an outdoor person. He liked to, liked to hunt. He liked to go out when he came home from, and take his truck and go four-wheel driving and get stuck. I mean, he'd always have to call somebody to come get him out. He didn't really like school that much. His friends all went to college. He was the only one that went into the service. He had his close friends. And to this day, 30-some years later, on the anniversary, there is a bouquet of flowers at the cemetery from his closest friends. Jeffrey... Um, graduated from high school in 1980, and he immediately went into the Marines. Now, that is not something we did not know about. I mean, he had already joined before he graduated, basically, and he went to his basic training in September to December of 1980. He always wanted to be a Marine. Uh, actually, both boys always wanted to be a Marine. And uh, he graduated in December down at Paris Island in 1980, then went to uh, Camp Geiger, which is the infantry. And then he later ride out and he was accepted into the reconnaissance. So he was with uh, Charlie Company, 2nd Recon, 2nd Marine Division. I got to go down to see him graduate and um, I'll never forget, uh, you know, they all come running off the field and I finally found him and I went to go hug him and he stood up straight and tall and he said, don't touch me, I'm a Marine. So, you know, uh, we miss him very much. What was he doing in Lebanon? And they were part of the multinational force that had been sent over by President Reagan. He volunteered to go. All the, all the, the boys that went to Lebanon volunteered to go. Actually, some of them re-enlisted, his best friend re-enlisted another six months so he could go. They were inseparable. And he was probably two heads taller than Jeffrey, and uh, he had been in college for two years. His mother was not very happy that uh, he joined the Marines. What happened to him, and how did you learn about the tragedy? Well, there had been several uh, of them Several of the, of the Marines had been killed uh, in, prior to the actual Marine Corps uh, barracks bombing, which was on October 23, 1983. Um, some of them had done by snipers, some of them had maybe a few uh, with a landmine or so. But on October the 23rd, um, a truck bearing actually the largest non-nuclear bomb that has ever been set off uh, came through the barracks 
and went into the building, which was an atrium type building. And it went into the building and exploded. This past Sunday, at 22 minutes after six Beirut time, with dawn just breaking, a truck looking like a lot of other vehicles in the city approached the airport on a busy main road. There was nothing in its appearance to suggest At the wheel was a young man on a suicide mission. The truck carried some 2,000 pounds of explosives. The truck crashed through a series of barriers, including a chain link fence and barbed wire entanglements. The guards opened fire, but it was too late. The truck smashed through the doors of the headquarters building in which our Marines were sleeping and instantly exploded. The four-story concrete building collapsed in a pile of rubble. More than 200 of the sleeping men were killed in that one hideous, insane attack. One of the survivors um, who I'm, I have been in contact with for several years, or 30-some years, he actually saw the bomber himself. He was inside the building when the truck came in, saw him, and he tells the story that he saw this shit-eating grin on this guy's face, and with that was a blast, and blew him out of the building. Fortunately, he survived. Um, unfortunately, um, I don't know if you would say he was mentally surviving uh, because he's had a rough time of it. But the building blew up, and it was a four-story building, and it imploded on in itself and came down and um, shook all the other buildings around in, in, in Beirut. And uh, uh, it was at the uh, Beirut airport is actually where the building was. That was the headquarters. Hmm. How, did, how did you learn of this? How were you notified? I don't know exactly the time, but it was before dawn. I had this funny feeling. I woke up wide awake and something came over me and I could feel d death. So I immediately ran downstairs and checked on my mother to see if she was okay. She was. I went back to bed. The next morning I got up and my husband's brother, who had been a Marine, called and said, have you seen what's going on in Lebanon? And we said no, so we turned the TV on. We were just glued to the television for several days. Um, my, my uncle had called and said, we saw Jeffrey on TV. And I said, oh, where? And he said, during the football game, they had, were running all kinds of, of interviews, et cetera, of these, of these young men that were in the bombing. And he said, I'm sure it was Jeffrey. So we got a call from Stone Phillips from ABC. And he said, uh, we'd like to come down and, and interview you. He said, I want you to get all the people that, you know, can be available to, that know Jeffrey, to come and, and we'll show you this, this film clippings that we have. And it was a picture of two fellas in pajamas and they were both carrying plastic bags and one of them was about five, six or seven and the other one was about six foot and we said, that's them. That's Bob and that's Jeff. They're together. And he, Stone Phillips, went around to everyone and said, is that right? And, you know, was that correct? And we all said yes, except Jeffrey's brother, John. And he said, no, that's not my brother. So that night, we got a, a knock on the door, and there was three people standing at the door. And it was the casualty officer. He came in, and he said, I'm sorry to tell you, but, you know, your son is missing. And we told him, no, he's not missing. We saw him on TV. Wednesday, I went back to work thinking they were wrong, that we had seen him on TV, and everybody left because they had, there had been somebody at our house the whole time. And um, we came home from work Wednesday night. We were by ourselves. We were sitting in the, in the rec room watching TV, and the doorbell rang again. And it was the casualty officer. I always wanted to go and see the place where Jeffrey died. That just meant a lot to me. So, and I had been calling and I actually went down to DC one time and spent the whole day going to different offices, immigration, the State Department, asking permission because you weren't allowed to travel to Beirut 
And one July morning before I was getting ready to go to work, I got a telephone call and the woman said, I'm calling from Madam Albright's office. She said, you're free to go. We went the 1st of, of October in 1998. It would have been the 15th anniversary. And we, didn't, we weren't going to stay long. All I wanted to do was to see the spot. Well, in the meantime, the actual building had been cleared. And we did find out that it had been cleared. But we still, I still was going anyway. So we told our son that if anything happens to us over there, or you know, uh, anything goes wrong, don't, don't you go to the Marines or the State Department or anybody because um, we're going there on our own accord and, and we, you know, we know what we're getting into. So we got on the plane in London and flew into Beirut and you only come in at night time. And we were the only Americans on the plane. Everybody else, I had no idea what language they were they were speaking. And I'm like, oh my goodness. And during this time, uh, I had been in contact with uh, one of the survivors. And he had said to me, we don't think you should go. But if you're going to go, I want to put you in touch with some friends of mine who will be with you while you're in Beirut. When we got there and we got off the plane, and of course it was all under Syrian control, and they all were standing around with their rifles and guns and everything. And all of a sudden, at the end of the you know, we see a bunch of people, and they're holding a sign, and the sign says, Mr. and Mrs. Young, and there was a lady with a big bouquet of flowers, and here these were the people that this young man had set up for us to be a part of. So they immediately took us under their wing. Um, they took us out to where the airport was, which was all fenced in. Then they took us to the hotel, which was the Summerlin Hotel. And they sat down in the lobby with us and said, well, now that you're here, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I thought I would get a, rent a car and, you know, we'll do things. No, 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 you don't do that. And first of all, you can't stay in this hotel. And I said, why? It's right on the Mediterranean. And they said, we're in Hezbollah territory. We're the Christians. You can't stay in this hotel. We'll come tomorrow and you'll move. So Father Malik knew I was bringing a bouquet of red, white, and blue roses with the names of all the fellas that had died wrapped around this bouquet. And he called this Judas Bouquet. And he said, you're going to go on a trip today. He said, but I can't go. He said, but I, I want you to, to, to let you know that I will be with you in spirit. So we get on the bus and we go up to uh, the mountains. And in the mountains, when we went up there, they had little Lebanese trees, little cedar trees. They, they couldn't have been more than a foot high. Each one of the trees um, had a marker and there was not a name on them but a number and we asked them what these were for and he said these trees were for each one of their freedom fighters that died uh, in the previous couple of years and they could not put names on them because of the Syrians they had to put numbers we get up to the mountain and up at the top of the mountain in this big, is this white stone and it's engraved with and I don't know exactly remember the naming, but it has Judith and John Young have come to Lebanon on this date. And here is the date that we were there in honor of their son, Jeffrey, and his fellow Marines. Well, I lost it. Jack lost it. They lost it. And then they started singing to us in, in Arabic. Uh, it was probably just something I'll, I'll never forget. Uh, it was just amazing. Okay, when we came back from Beirut, Okay, it was the 15th anniversary. We always go to North Carolina for uh, the anniversary. There's a big ceremony down there. Now these people in North Carolina have treated us wonderful, but they thought, you know, they'd put a wreath on, on, on our wall. We have a wall, and that would be the end of us. You know, every year they'd do that. Well, guess what? Every year there's a couple thousand people that come in for this ceremony, and they have this big ceremony every year. So on the 15th anniversary, we go down there and we were at a hotel room and they were some of the, the young men, they were playing you know, guitars and everything and we've got to know quite a few of them. And um, anyway, I went outside and this one fellow comes up to me and he says, so how was your trip? And I said, uh, fine. I said, how did you know? And he just looked at me and he said, 
we knew where you were most of the time. I said, you did? He says, yes, I'm with the Naval Intelligence. <laughs> I said, oh, okay. He says, why did you go? And I said, I wanted a piece of the building. He said, did you? He said, well, the building's not there anymore. And I said, no, I know. I said, but I wanted a piece of the building. He said, well, tomorrow morning before we go to uh, the ceremony, he said, you meet me in the in the hallway on the second floor. So I did. The next morning, I went down there. I met him in the hallway. And here he had this piece about this big of the building that he had gotten. He said, that's not the only piece I have. But he said, um, I have a big piece that I'm saving for something. He said, but I want you to have the piece of this building. And I thought, oh my gosh, I go all the way to Beirut to get a piece of the building. And I wind up coming back to Jacksonville, North Carolina, and I get a piece of the building. About 15 years ago, uh, um, I had these attorneys come to our house and they said they're, they uh, uh, were going to uh, have a lawsuit against Iran. And I said, well, you can't do that. I said, because I've already asked one of the lawyers uh, that was one of my customers at the, at the bank, and I said, you can't sue a country. And he says, oh, yes, you can. He said, we have already sued Iran, and her name was Flatlow, and we won our case. She was killed over in uh, by Iran over in um, Israel, and uh, he said we would we know you seem to have all the names and dresses of, of of the families, and we've been told that you do have them. And I said yes, but I said I'm, I won't give them to you because I never give the names and addresses out. But I said if you send me the letters that you want to send out, I'll address them and I will mail them to the families and then it's up to them as to what they want to do. Since then, I mean, it's been 15 years that we've been dealing with this. We we won our case uh, in um, the court in D.C. We had to hire all these guys from New York and then we won both cases in New York. Um, all the families had to give a deposition all over the country. They were all done. And then the judge finally came back and awarded each, each family an amount. And then, of course, Iran never actually fought against us, but each time we won, they would come back and challenge it. Iran decided they were going to take it to the Supreme Court, which they did. Last August, they uh, gave their deposition to the Supreme Court. Supreme Court gets about 80, about 10,000 cases a year, and they only take 80. So even the attorneys were shocked because they thought that the Supreme Court would not take that case. Well, yes, they did. They took the case. So in January of this year, about two weeks ago, there were six of us that had res reserved seats at the Supreme Court. And we went down and listened to, to Iran's, um, they were now suing us. Uh, at the Supreme Court hearing, which was two weeks ago, Wednesday, they, they beat both sides up. I mean, I, I couldn't believe they're in the middle of the, Iran's uh, lawyers, and they're American lawyers, they're not, they're not Iranian lawyers, but they're, I mean, they would be in the middle of, of the case and the Supreme Justices, they just butt right in and ask questions and they beat both sides up. So you really couldn't tell how they feel. But the attorneys, especially my, our attorney, Tom Fay, who's just wonderful, um, they are the ones that have footed everything for the last 13 years. The families have not put anything out. Uh, I, we don't know. I mean, this is the last stand after 13, 14 years. Uh, whether there will be any any amounts coming to any of the families or not. And, of course, a lot of the families now have been deceased. But we should probably know by June if, if this is it because uh, it's been going on all this time. When did the organization start? Well, the organization itself, which is the American Gold Star Mothers, began by Miss Grace Siebold who was a very prominent Washingtonian woman whose son was flying for the British. And he had been lost at the time. And she began visiting hospitals, etc., actually looking for him just in case he had been missing. And uh, about uh, in 1925, she decided that 
she would get a group of women together, there was 25 of them, and form an organization for mothers who had lost their sons uh, during the war. And it became the American Gold Star Mothers. And what, and what, what, that was the purpose? Was it? Well, the purpose was to actually visit the hospitals because that's what she had been doing. Um, and even, uh, even now, I mean, that is the main thrust of the American Gold Star Mothers, give back to the veterans in some way. It has really developed in a lot more than just visiting the hospitals, but I mean, their hours are counted because they've done thousands of hours. Is your organization approved by Congress? The organization was chartered in Congress by President Reagan. So it is a chartered VSO and recognized as such. And where are your headquarters? The headquarters is in Washington, D.C. And of course, that's where Grace was from. So it's only natural that it's in Washington. We have a house. Uh, it's on Leroy Place. <laughs> and it actually is a, a house that serves as the office. When we house the National Board, when they come in, sleeps 12. And the National Board comes in several times a year for, for meetings. How are you organized? Are there chapters, local uh, or lo local places, or how, how does that work? Yeah, it's it's. Um, <laughs> when I came into headquarters, we were still doing our m uh, membership on three by five cards. I mean, everything was way way behind, um, and I didn't really know how to to do all the new technical stuff. So I brought in one of the new moms from Iraq. And she was very good at it. Do you do you maintain contact with the the, the uh, families of other members who, who lost their lives there? That's been my mission since 1983. I got a call saying that there was some Philadelphia families that were meeting, and would we like to come over and, and meet some of them? And we met families from Philadelphia. There was one family from Connecticut there, and from then on, uh, every other month we had a meeting at either Philadelphia or over to our house and we started gathering people, moms, dads, mostly, mostly moms and dads. And in probably April or May, this other mom and I kind of connected. Uh, her husband and, and Jack became good, good friends also. And she knew a friend who knew the lady who wrote Dear Abby. And she said, let's let's send a letter to Dear Abby, because what we wanted was pictures, because everything had been lost in the bombing. So Dear Abby published a, le a letter saying that we were the family of the Beirut uh, servicemen, and we were looking for other families. And we got a lot of moms and dads who wrote and said, yes, you know, our son was killed, and, um, you know, we'd like to uh, uh, see some pictures, etc. And one lady from Texas said, why don't we have a newsletter? So for 13 years, Joan, her name is Joan Muffler, uh, Joan and I did a newsletter. And our last mailing, we had like 400 and some that we mailed to. What was your first contact uh, with the Gold Star Mothers? How I learned about it was the Philadelphia families who we had been meeting with, some of them had joined the Philadelphia chapter. It wasn't until uh, probably in the late 19, 1990s that uh, I decided I think I'm going to switch and belong to a New Jersey chapter. How did you progress to become well, the national president? Well, that, that was actually fairly easy. <laughs> First meeting, we had five people. That's all there was. So the second meeting, I was named the president, and I wound up being on the National Executive Board uh, at my first convention. So uh, by the time came around, for me, you have to be on the board for two years to begin with. Then after you've been on the board for two years, then you can move up to second, then first, and then national president. So um, I was the first non-Vietnam mom to be a national president. But like I said, we were, they were, it, it, we were like the sandwich. I, I'm, another mom and I came on together and we were like the sandwich moms because our sons were not the Vietnam moms and we were not the Iraq Afghanistan moms. So there's that big 30 year span in there that there were no moms coming in. I went to my first convention with one of the New Jersey moms who was a past national president and they immediately 
wanted to be, me to be on the National Executive Board because they were running out of moms. It's been a journey of mine throughout my time in Congress with Judy to get to where we almost are there to have this monument erected. It wasn't an easy battle. Judy and I pushed from both sides to make this happen. And it's going to be an awesome monument when it does, and it will get erected. It's just a matter of time as Judy continues to fight this battle and we continue to support her and help her through awareness. Tell us about the uh, Gold Star Mothers Memorial. Well, when I was on the National Executive Board, we had um, a fellow in New York wanted to have a monument. So our national, the, the mom who was a national president who was from Long Island, her and a couple other moms went over and they had a series of statues, et cetera, that had been submitted. And they picked this particular statue by Andrew Chernick, who's a Vietnam veteran from Pennsylvania. And this was going to be put in a veterans park. So actually that was the last thing I did when I was national president. I dedicated this monument. Uh, it is a picture, it is a statue of a woman who is depicting World War II. She has the dress of a World War II. She is holding a telegram because that's the way they inform people during World War II. And that was chosen because in World War II that was the largest amount of casualties. So that's why she was chosen. The sculptor's wife was the woman who actually posed for this for the sculpture. So um, we had that dedicated and I happened to mention at the dedication that it would really be nice if we had this statue in other places so that people would, as soon as they see her, I call her Our Lady, as soon as I saw Our Lady, they would know that she was a Gold Star Mother. So I was still on the National Executive Board, I was a National Service Officer, and I agreed to drop off the board and I would take on this project that we would get our statue, Our Lady, in Washington, D.C. Because I thought it was going to be this easy job of just getting a statue in, in Washington and maybe four or five years and I'd be, I'd be finished. Uh, but that, <laughs> that hasn't really turned out that way. Uh, since then we have a statue in Warminster, New Hampshire and there's also one in Connecticut. So we have them in three different states and there's two other states that are considering it right now. Uh, so in 2007 I started with the fundraising and Andrew, the sculptor, the two of us decided this was going to be our project. We had no idea how much political that you had to go through to begin with. Um, three bills passed and John Runyon got the last bill passed. I formed the Gold Star Mothers National Monument Foundation and incorporated in New Jersey. We are now going to be in Arlington National Cemetery, just waiting for the National Park Service basically to turn around and say, this is the spot, this is theirs. Any, did Congress authorize any money uh, to pay for this? No. Uh, Congress, Congress does not allow us to have any federal funds and I had it right in the bill that there would be no federal funds for this project. We have been fundraising. We started with our, our pin, we have a patch and then we do have a fundraiser out of New York and uh, she at this point uh, has obtained the AFL-CIO out of Washington, uh, their veterans division and they will be doing fundraising. It's been estimated it's going to cost around eight million dollars. We do our own little fundraising here or there. I do get support from uh, uh, veterans groups. Our biggest veterans group, and they're not a veterans group actually, is Rolling Thunder. Uh, and Rolling Thunder, of course, national headquarters is in New Jersey. Um, Artie Muller is on my, on my board and they support us every year 
with a nice check and that kind of keeps us keeps us going. The Rolling Thunder has been fantastic to, to the Gold Star Mothers. The idea is to educate the people who come through Arlington that this is going to be called the Gold Star Mothers Family Monument because the focus now is on family. And even though she will be, the Our Lady will be the main statue in, these, in this memorial, there will be other things called reliefs and that is what the architect is, um, the sculptor is working on. And they will be depicting various things that attribute to the family. Uh, Judith, well, thank you very much. Uh, you are a remarkable woman. And thank you very much for the, you know, the work that you're doing. Uh, uh, you've taken a, uh, you know, an absolutely terrible thing and have done so much good as a result. And uh, we can't thank you enough. Thank you for letting me tell it.